Um, this also retweeted by David Wallace Wells. Um, I find this, I don't know. I find this not just confusing, but anger inducing there, you know, the whole, the whole lot of people who are like nuclear power is totally green energy, you know, without understanding the consequences of abrupt climate change on the safety of nuclear power plants. You know, there's this whole, you can, you know, you, you can maybe debate, you know, up and down how nuclear energy is more cost effective <clears throat> than, than coal or gas or whatever, or how it's clean and blah, blah, blah. But you just, I, I just find people that support nuclear power to be, um, I don't know, delusional maybe, or just they're missing a lot of information in their argument. Anyway, somebody, Alex Gilbert tweeted, retirements of Exelon's nuclear units at, at Byron and Dresden will reduce U.S. nuclear capacity by more than four gigawatts by 2021. That is equivalent of, of uh, 2% of U.S. carbon-free generation. And then somebody retweeted this, Jane Flegel. This is really, really bad for the climate. Okay. <clears throat> Okie dokie. <laughs> uh, I, and I said, huh? I don't really understand. I don't understand this position. I don't understand how people don't understand the dangers of nuclear power and how nuclear power is running straight up against climate change. You have uh, reactors in France being closed down almost every single summer because of extra warm waters. You have reactors continually being exposed to flooding uh, in the Midwest and in the, in the southern states of the United States. Every time we have a, a you know, 500-year or 1,000-year floods or we have, you know, Category 4 or 5 hurricanes, which is now every single year. Every single year. Um. Yeah, Richard Monroe, 5,000 nuke plants would be needed, you know, probably more. So, you know, you know the, the, the reliance on nuclear power needs to be done away with, period. The end, end of story. Because we can't, if we have societal breakdown, we're not going to have anybody to control these plants. We're going to be, um, you know, nuclear power rests on the idea that industrial civilization is going to be continuous or there's going to be some continuity of the people in charge or continuity of a grid or continuity of climate or continuity of, you know, everything. There's so many things that have to continue to keep going the way they are right now to keep nuclear power running. And that's just not going to happen. I'm sorry. We're going to, we're 10 years out from major, major collapse. And you have people out there, you know, wishing and praying and hoping for nuclear energy. Good God. Um, I just, how can you not be more unconnected from reality or the facts? <laughs> you know, we're not, we don't have thor thorium reactors. There are no thorium reactors in existence that are working right now. Maybe some are being built. I, I've heard possibly they're being built, but there are no, no thorium reactors online right now. And they're extremely dangerous. If you just look it up, if you just research thorium reactors, they're really dangerous. That's why they were never developed. And the building of reactors and the, the decommissioning of reactors is incredibly, incredibly energy intensive. What we need to do immediately is decommission every single reactor on the planet right now because we are not going to have a functioning society. We're, you know, we're probably not going to have a functioning society long enough to decommission those reactors fast enough before disaster strikes. Um, well, there's a weird idea going south. Whales are hunted sustainably. I, I don't understand. <clears throat> In, 
in an indigenous culture, there they they might be hunted hunted sustainably. <clears throat> I think that's what you're getting at. <clears throat> However, human beings have destroyed all large mammals and large beings on this planet, and it's time the destruction stops. The end. <laughs> the end. Whether it's sustainable or not, or whether it's uh, cultural or not, it's got to stop. Osama, there's nowhere to put the waste, indeed. Matt Nove, it takes decades to fully dismantle a reactor plant, and the lifespan is a few decades. Why build them? Indeed. It just, you know, it's extremely... Nuclear power plants are illogical on so many levels. And yet, just because they're green, they have no carbon emissions. Oh, there, there goes an answer. There goes one. Over there. Ask the Animals also says, yeah, ask, also ask the Lakota and Navajo how mining of radioactive elements worked out for them. Right. <clears throat> G. Demarest, decommissioning takes longer than society will most likely last. I, but I urge society at large to start right now. <laughs> right now. In fact, I read an article a few, uh, maybe it was last year on the channel, that they were developing a new a new way of decommissioning nuclear power plants that was much faster than usual, right? It usually takes 50 or 60 years, but they had developed a new system to do it within like 10 or 20 years. So um, there's ongoing uh, progress in that front. So if they use that system or develop that system, you know, perhaps we may have a chance to de de decommission all nuclear plants in 20 years? I don't know. But where, where are we going to put the waste exact? Osama exactly? <clears throat> Keith Hayes, sustainably in a world of 8 billion is a fantasy. Exactly. Um, let's move on. I just found that concerning <laughs> uh, as maybe y'all did too. And David Wallace Wells re retweeted that. So I find, I find that concerning. Let's go on to look at Laura. Um, now a tropical storm down from, uh, category four. This is where Laura is at now. I don't know if we have any sound on this. Moving towards Memphis and Tupelo. I have some uh, good friends in Memphis, so I hope they're taking care. Uh, breaking Louis Louisiana's first fatality from Hurricane Laura has been reported as a 14-year-old girl. Uh, died after a tree falls on the family's home. Uh, damaging winds and flooding rainfall spreading inland over western central Louisiana. Life-threatening storm surge. That was five hours ago. Power outages here in Louisiana. Quite a few. Looking at pow power outages also going up uh, through the path here into Arkansas. And maybe Tennessee. So a lot of, a lot of damage to the coast. And one death. Keith Hayes, what crops will Laura destroy? Right. Indeed. What... Um, it will move probably through some some cropland. It 
Soy, maybe. The uh, Human Love says, Solidarity says the United States has over 90,000 metric tons of nuclear waste that requires disposal. Um, let's move on to this tweet from Go Green. Uh, responding to, let's see if I can read this from the Guardian. I don't know if I'm going to be able to. Uh, Go Green was responding to this article in the Guardian saying population panic. I think it's a George Mambio uh, article. Population panic lets rich people off the hook for a climate crisis. Um, they are conducting. Uh, Go Green says, no, you got that wrong. The rich get richer by encouraging more population growth and more consumers and more consumption and more labor slaves, slaves to feed the monster capitalist machine. Tackle both problems head on. Bang. Um, I like this tweet from, from Go Green. That's absolutely correct. Both. It doesn't have to be either or. In fact, it is, is not either or. The capitalist system has, has now made, made it necessary for everyone, including rich and poor, to live in the system, right? We've exported our, our machine, our system, everywhere around the world, and now everybody is trapped in the system. Um, and everybody is contributing to the problem. And... More and more people means more and more consumers, means more and more capitalists, means, you know, on and on and on and on. So it has to be tackled from both, both sides, I believe. And I agree. Let's look at this article a little bit uh, from George Mambio, August, from uh, yesterday, August 26th. Population panic lets rich people off the hook for climate crisis they are fueling. Rising consumption by the affluent has a far greater environmental impact than the birth rate in poor nations. Well, yes, we know this. We do know that the rich uh, pollute far, far more than the poor. Um, that, you know, the first world countries have, you know, triple, quadruple the carbon footprint of anybody living in a, in a first world country or developing nation. Um, however, you know, we're trying to export this, this way of life to, you know, the standard of living to the rest of the world, right? So all of these developing nations, that's why they're called developing no nations because they're developing capitalism, they're developing consumerism, developing a, you know, this supposed, this arbitrary standard of living that everybody has to live in are all going to want to consume all the things that, you know, we're, we're, we're supposed to consume uh, being first world dwellers. <clears throat> that is false. That is destruction. That is, planet, that is planetary death. Um, that is ensuring planetary death. So that has to be stopped right away. Whether you're, you live in a poor country or you live in a rich country, right away, all of that must be stopped. When a major study was published last month showing that the global population is likely to peak then crash much sooner than most scientists had assumed, I naively <clears throat> imagined that people in rich nations would at last stop blaming all the world's environmental problems on population growth. I was wrong. If anything, it appears to have got worse. Next week, the birth strike movement founded by women who, by announcing their decision not to have children, seek to focus our minds on the horror of environmental collapse will dissolve itself because its cause has been hijacked so virulently and persistently by population obsessives. Yeah, but, you know, if you're aware of the, the impact that population has on the planet and on resources, then you can make an educated decision not to be a part of the problem, right, or not to have more children. That's just very, very logical. You're not talking about, let's go kill some people, or I wish these people over here, you know, would take care of their population problem. No, you're, you're, you're dealing with it by raising awareness. And you're hopefully acting in accordance with that awareness in your own life and being a model for other people to do the same, right? 
It is true that in some parts of the world, population growth is a major driver of particular kinds of ecological damage, such as expansion of small-scale agriculture into rainforest, the bushmeat trade, and local pressure on water and land for housing. But its global impact is much smaller than many people claim. The formula for calculating people's environmental footprint is simple, but widely misunderstood. Impact equals population times affluence times technology. I equals PAT, or PAT. <clears throat> the global rate of consumption growth before the pandemic was 3% a year. Population growth is 1%. Some people assume this means that the rise in population bears one-third of the responsibility for increased consumption, but population growth is overwhelmingly concentrated among the world's poorest people, who have scarcely any A or T to uh, multiply their P. The extra resource use and greenhouse gas emissions caused by a rising human population are a tiny fraction of the impact of consumption growth. Yet it is widely used as a blanket explanation of environmental breakdown. Panic about population growth enables the people most responsible for the impacts of rising consumption, the affluent, to blame those who are least responsible. And, yeah, and I believe that that is partly true, sure. Um, but that doesn't mean that you cannot say the word overpopulation or you can't say, Hey, population is a problem. Population growth, uh, you know, every, what about population growth or population, uh, stability, I guess, in, uh, high consumer cultures, right? Every child that is born into a first world country or first world, uh, capitalist society is emitting tons and tons and tons of carbon it is widely used as a blanket explanation of environmental breakdown. Panic of po about population growth enables the people most responsible for the impacts of rising consumption, the affluent to blame those who are least responsible at this year's world economic forum in Davos, the primatologist Dame Jane Goodall, who is a patron of the charity population manners matters told the assembled plutocrat uh, pollutocrats, some of whom, whom have ecological footprints thousands of times greater than the global average. All these things we talk about wouldn't be a problem if there was the size of population that there was 500 years ago. I doubt that any of those who nodded and clapped were thinking, yes, I urgently need to d disappear. Right. <clears throat> of course, that's very true because population is only a problem for other people and not for you or your people, right? In 2019, Goodall appeared in the advertisement for British Airways, whose customers produce more greenhouse gas emissions in one fly on one flight than many of the world's people generate in a year. If we had the global population of 500 years ago, around 500 million, and if it were composed of average UK plane passengers, our environmental impact would probably be greater than that of the 7.8 billion alive today. She proposed no mechanism by which her dream might come true. This could be the attraction. The very impotence of her call is reassuring to those who don't want to change. If the answer to environmental crisis is to wish other people away, we might as well give up and carry on consuming. The excessive emphasis on population growth has a grim history. Okay, so et cetera, et cetera. We all... Um, I, I, I know where this is going. I'm not going to read any more. Um, and I know exactly what his argument is. And I I totally get it. Um, if anything, we should. Uh, Going South says, for some leftists, population is never a problem and a lich mob can never be wrong. Um Osama, what kind of future does a child born today face? Is it fair to them? These are all legitimate questions. Um, I think that we should start with our consumer culture and the, you know, the amazing massive amount of resources and damage that our consumer culture does every single day and our military industrial complex does every single day. Um, I think we, we, we would be right and just in starting there. And if you actually looked at the, there's another equation 
that I think George Mambio is leaving out of that, his article, and that is uh, fossil fuel use um, in all aspects of our society allows 8 billion people to be alive, right? So if you, if you actually take down that energy consumption, right, and, and it's really about energy, even if you're not talking about fossil fuel use, you, you can't keep 8 billion people alive without that kind of fossil fuel consumption. And that fossil fuel consumption is driving what? Planet destruction. <laughs> so, I mean, that you have to really talk about that equation as well. Um, so we, we have to talk about lowering our overall resource use and our overall consumption use and understand that you know, yeah, I, I, I believe we could go a lot farther if first world countries adopted a degrowth, a degrowth paradigm, um, you know, rather than address population as a driving, co- I don't, you know, driving cause of climate destruction. Um, however, however, if you address fossil fuel consumption, po- fossil fuel production, and consumer consumer consumption and consumer economies if you address all of that then you're going to take that you know that's going to have a ripple effect but i would i'm i'm never and i would never and i have never in my life suggested that it's it's some other population's fault for overpopulation or you know who do we kill today that's like the that's the knee jerk Oh, you're talking about over, oh my God, how dare you talk about overpopulation? No, no, no. You can have a discussion about it. You can have an enlightened discussion about it. <clears throat> it is not immediately racist to talk about overpopulation. But what are you saying about overpopulation makes it either racist or not racist? Where are you devoting your attention, right? If you're devoting your attention to awareness, the awareness of the, you know, of the situation that you know, more and more people d- devouring more and more things and consuming more and more energy leads to planet destruction. Well, then you're aware that you need to, you know, need to make a personal <clears throat> commitment to less people on the planet or less consumption at the very least. Um, so I'm not, I'm not suggesting any of the things that people suggest that like, if you say the word overpopulation, you're immediately like, Oh, who are we going to kill? No. Right. I am sweetly first world become third world instead of third world become first world. Right. Exactly. And that's, you know, the problem too, you know, like let's move population to the side. The problem is that, you know, we are hurtling down the path of, you know, we must export our way of life and the, the entire planet must live the way that we live. That is fundamentally the driver of climate destruction and fundamentally patently false. If you are if you are a wealthy famous person and you want to do about, something about climate change, well then, um, you know, be a model for the rest of the planet and give up all your money, uh, devote all of your wealth to tackling climate change, and you know, stop flying in planes, stop taking trips, stop owning all kinds of property, uh, become basically an asset. Uh, aesthetic, I guess, you know, right? Give up, give up all your worldly goods and broadcast it to the world. You know, keep just enough to keep yourself alive or keep your family alive or whatever. You could probably live very, very comfor- comfortably on that last half a million dollars you have for the rest of your life. Um, let's start there. But if you're, a, if you're a capitalist or if you're a billionaire or you're an actor or you're a musician or you're a, like a famous wealthy person and you're like, well, we got to do something about that climate change. Anyways, I, I opened up this really great like tourist spot. Uh, it's next to my third home. Yeah, you're full of shit. You don't know what you're talking about. You're, you're a liar. You don't care about climate change and you don't understand your role in it. Anyways, let's move on. So I agree with the Go Greens tweet in that it is both. The wealthy, the wealthy countries driving um, 
environmental damage and population and a growing population and a growing consumer base for the entire world is also not good, not good, not good at all. Um, Kendra E. Moyer, I'm fairly poor in the U.S. and I have too much stuff. Uh, yep. I'm, I'm fairly poor and I have way too much stuff. Way too much stuff. I'm trying to rid myself, of, not rid myself, but, you know, I'm l slowly letting go of, th go of things as they, you know, break down or become obsolete or become old. I just let go of a lot of stuff. And I slowly pare my life down into simpl simplicity. Kendra Moyer, overconsumption is a social activity. In yep, yep. Robert Araujo decided to go poor and leave city five years ago. Good on you. Yes, be poor for the pl climate. That's what I suggest. Get poor. Give up your stuff. Um, give up your needs. Give up your um, all your needs. You know, or many of your needs and wants. Simplify your life. Like really, truly simplify your life. Um. You know, lower your your bills or your need to, you know, have so many things. Lower what you what lower your output a month and lower your in income a month. James Osborne, I'm a minimalist with a hoarder wife. <clears throat> yeah. Good job. Veronica, be a vegan for the climate. Indeed. Gene, I agree, Kevin. Actually, it makes you feel good. Yes. Um, let's see how much, how many more things I can cover. Well, let's, let's cover this before I go. I have one more story I want to cover. I can't get to them all every day. I'm, I'm running short of time. But this is from The Conversation, how a Green New Deal could exploit developing countries. Let's, let's find out what this is about. The Green New Deal has changed the conversation among progressive Democrats about how to deal with climate change, but from simply managing a disaster to how to take advantage of an existential threat to build a more just society. However, should this legislative concept be transformed from the hypothetical framework it is today into actual policies, some of the solution, solutions it engenders could make global inequality worse as a scholar of colonialism, I am concerned that the Green New Deal could exacerbate what scholars like sociologist Doreen Martinez call climate colonialism. The domination of less powerful countries and peoples through initiatives meant to slow the pace of global warming. Let's read on. Colonialism explained. The clearest cases of colonialism involve the unmistakable signifiers of foreign control, planted flags in the formal and institutionally recognized assertion of authority over foreign lands. Only five countries in the world were not colonized by European empires in one way or another after the 15th century. The history of colonialism has many clear milestones, including the 1494 Treaty of Tor uh, Tordesillas between Spain, Portugal, and the Vatican that divided the world outside Europe between the two Iberian empires. At the Berlin Conference of 1884, European powers divvied the African continent among themselves. U.S. colonialism has often been less stark, but the United States does occupy land that belonged to people who lived in North America before European settlers arrived. Following the realization of its manifest destiny, it also went beyond its coastal borders by taking over many islands, including those in Hawaii, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam. Likewise, overt foreign influence and control has become the exception rather than the rule, even for the original colony, colonial powers. Throughout much of a Africa and Asia, global empires like the British preferred a strategy of indirect rule, with chieftaincies, monarchies, and other power structures that let them delegate their domination to local elites. Neocolonialism and climate colonialism. In 1946, there were only 35 member states of the United Nations, 
Once most formal co former colonies had become independent countries by 1970, the number had swelled to 127. Amid this wave of independence, rich countries continued to exert control over former colonies through a system Ghana's first prime minister, Kwame uh, Nkrumah, <clears throat> first called neocolonialism. Rather than directly running the countries, other countries, neocolonial domination is accomplished through levers of political and economic leverage. Green New Deal policies could empower communities on both sides of the U.S. borders and could expand the powers of poor nations to determine their own destinies. Or they could promote climate colonialism, a term that can mean different things to different people. To me, it's the deepening or expansion of foreign domination through climate initiatives that exploit poor nations' resources or otherwise compromise their sovereignty. But isn't that what we already have right now? We have... <laughs> we have... Uh, capitalist colonialism uh, right now at the moment, and it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, others focus, you know, whether a country is uh, operating independently or not, if anybody has read um, The Economic Hitman, I forget the author of the book, but great book. Global corporations control Every single country, every single country, including ours. But global corporations uh, are practicing colonialism right now in every single country on the planet. Uh, that's already a done deal. So others focus more on how formerly colonized countries are paying the price for a crisis caused disproportionately by the emissions of more. I'd say the way to, the way to really uh, fight either cl climate colonialism or capitalist colonialism colonialism is to kick out these corporations and nationalize whatever industries you have and you know and whatever resources you have inside that country i encourage every country to do this but many countries that have been trying to do this bolivia venezuela etc right they kicked out the corporations or tried to and the u.s government was like hey 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 you know we're the paid we're the pro we're the we are the mercenaries for these corporations we're the, we're the paid thugs for these corporations, so you guys can't do that. We're going to come in and give you some democracy. Others focus more on how formerly colonized countries are paying the price for a crisis caused disproportionately by the emissions from more industrialized nations, their current and past colonizers. Land grabbing and exporting solar power, but the Green, Green New Deal will not meet any definition of climate justice if it becomes <clears throat> the next chapter in a long history of U.S. industrial policies that have oppressed people. During the 19th century, when the transcontinental railway system arose, the U.S. gave land to rail companies it had taken away from Native Americans. In a series of coerced treaties and wars, similarly, responding to global warming may require vast tracts of land to grow food and carry out new policies as the climate changes. A global land rush is already underway around the globe. Indeed, <clears throat> China, and uh, European countries, U.S., everyone is like, hey, we need what you got. <clears throat> Take, for example, carbon offsets, a form of investment in greenhouse gas emissions reduction that lets the buyer offset the effects of their emissions pr producing activity. Much of the available land is in poor countries and inhabited by people who are, who are those countries least politically powerful. This can put them in competition for the land that prov provides their basic needs with powerful private interests from the world's most powerful countries. For instance, a research institute reported in 2014 that Norwegian companies quest to buy and conserve forest land in East Africa to use as carbon offsets came at the cost of forced evictions and food scarcity for thousands of Ugandans, Mozambicans, and Tanzanians. Wow. <clears throat> Did you all know that? Did you know? The Green New Deal could encourage exactly this kind of political trade-off. Efforts to boost energy security can also drive climate colonialism. The African continent is paradoxically both home to the world's largest solar power plant. The Noir uh, Orzazate complex in Morocco and people who are the least connected to the grid. Solar power may end up giving more Africans access to electricity, but at the same time, many large renewable energy projects in North Africa could soon boost 
the European electric grid, bolstering European energy security with a climate-friendly source of power while millions of sub-Saharan Africans have none of their own. Daniel A.M. Egbe, the coordinator of the African Network for Solar Energy, calls this linkage of large-scale solar farms with foreign power grids a new form of resource exploitation. Wild. The, the Green New Deal's stated goal of meeting all of America's considerable and potentially increasing energy demand with renewable or zero emission sources could create an incentive to go this route, too, with Mexico. California already imports electricity from Baja California State, and business interests stand ready to expand cross-border grid links throughout Central America if that proves feasible. <clears throat> Look out, guys, because we need that energy. To go back to the last article or thing I was talking about, we cannot continue to consume the amount of energy that we're consuming. All of this is going to, again, lead to more exploitation and more destruction. Even if it's renewables, even if it's green new jobs and green new power, More exploitation, more destruction, more, more, more. Um, Hold on, I think I lost my article. Uh, Where am I? Help, I lost my article. Oh, here we are. To be clear, I do not believe the Green New Deal will necessarily lead to climate colonialism, and I see its emphasis on climate justice as a good start. Technologies and policies are tools, and how they function depends on how they are designed and how they are used. The U.S. could, for instance, do more to subsidize renewable energy technologies because American innovation can expedite their adoption everywhere. The U.S. could also follow the lead of the federal government's National Academy of Sciences and fund a substantial research initiative on negative emissions which the inter- Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change identifies as necessary to prevent the world's the worst climate change scenarios, the Green New Deal in its current draft form is just as compatible with, its path, with this path as it is with climate colonialism, but I do believe that achieving a version of, version of climate justice that doesn't end at U.S. borders will require the right vision, values, and strategies. <clears throat> or we could talk about degrowth, de-escalation, Deindustrialization, living off the land, re-greening, re-wilding, um, encouraging people to live agricultural lifestyles, encouraging people to live with a lot, lot less as far as energy goes, encouraging people to not, li- you know, not have to go out and consume all the things that they're supposed to consume. That might, that might uh, entail turning off the TV or turning off the advertisements. Or turning off the switch in your brain that requires you to go out and just buy a new thing whenever whenever you think you need it or whatever it is that you think you need. Go, go, go. More, more, more. We need another appliance. We need more clothes. We need more stuff. Hey, guys, remember to like, share, and subscribe. And you can support the channel. The link's below. Uh, PayPal, Patreon, Square. Uh, also, if you'd like to watch the live streams. You can watch the live streams on my Patreon channel. You can subscribe for as little as a dollar. So hopefully I will see you over there and thanks so much.